How you doing? I'm Mike Gaddy. Welcome to the Patterson Park Podcast. Before we get started on this week's episode, I wanted to let you know two quick things. First, we have a new Facebook page, the Patterson Park Podcast Facebook page. Please check it out, join, and you'll get updates as to what all the artists and activists and community leaders that are featured on the podcast have been up to since their last episode. Second, on April 24th at 1 p.m., we will be doing a live stream right to the Patterson Park Podcast Facebook page featuring Molly Miller updating us on what she has been doing since her episode aired a few months ago. Check it out. It's at 1 p.m. It will stream live. Right now, sit back. Enjoy this week's episode featuring singer Candace Potts. Take a listen. How you doing? I'm Mike Gaddy and welcome to the 743 Patterson Park Podcast. This week I got to sit down with Candace Potts. I met Candace in a non-traditional way. I was sitting watching Facebook live feeds, kind of, you know, doing my thing, and I came across a live feed by Aaron. Aaron, you may remember, uh, from an earlier episode where he appeared with his mother and we talked about creativity and response under the COVID-19 pandemic of creative people learning new things. Well, anyway, he's jamming on the piano and all of a sudden this woman starts to sing right in the middle of the park. And I swear to God, she ripped the emotions right from my head. There's no other way to describe it. I fell in love with her and I tracked her down. I hounded Erin. I emailed her. I texted her. I begged her to come on the podcast and I'm so glad she did. So right now, sit back, put your headphones on, take a listen to me with singer, songwriter, uh, arranger, and even plus size model, Candace Potts. Take a listen. When Candace, and I'm so excited to have you on the podcast. I really am. Uh, because she decided to assist Aaron Hill and his mom out in the park a couple of weeks back, maybe a week ago now, uh, and did a live pop up concert uh, at the Lake, Lake Monticello. Montebello. Uh, at Lake Montebello, and started singing in the middle of the park and doing this fantastic live concert. So that piqued my interest and I decided to, um, to start stalking her, which is what I do when I want an artist on the podcast and sending text messages, don't you want to be on the podcast? Uh, right. um, and, and she very graciously agreed to come on. And there's several reasons why I'm really excited to have you. One is you are a graduate of the Baltimore School of Art, right? Yes, Baltimore School for the Arts and also Morgan State University. So real hometown girl. How, um, what did, what, what was your degree in with, at the Baltimore School in Morgan? Music. Music was bo both vocal performance where my, um, my major and concentration at both. So you are a singer, a songwriter, an arranger, a recording artist, and a model. All yeah. combined into one luscious package. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and by the way, you all, this isn't, um, this doesn't come through when I do the podcast, but 
it says my name on the Zoom call, and then on on uh, on Candace's uh, end, it says Queen Candy Pops. <laughs> so I said it should be Queen Michael Gaddy, and she, you know, she was like, <laughs> All right, so you're a graduate of Baltimore. What got you into singing? How? Tell me a little bit about your uh, about how your career has has blossomed. Yes, yeah, so I started out singing in um, church. You know, I was always interested in my, both my parents sang, my dad and my mom. Um, and it's crazy because music is on both sides of my family, on my dad's side of my family and on my mom's side. My grandparents sang, my aunts, my uncles, my cousins. It's almost like if you don't come out singing, there's something wrong with you. <laughs> but yeah, started, you know, of course, they were in a um, local group here in Baltimore, um, when you know late uh before you know when i around the ages of uh three and four i would always accompany them to you know their rehearsals and um i guess that's when it started to spark my interest but then um as i got older and um watching the sound of music was when my interest in classical slash you know uh broadway kind of sparked my interest and I'm like wow Julie Andrews is amazing um and um <laughs> every, yes Man, I, I totally <laughs> <laughs> the sound of I just loved it I was just like oh my goodness um I want to sound like that and so my parents um I've been very blessed to have so many different opportunities and my parents um found a you know tutoring program um at the bottom school for the arts called twigs program where you know you get to start out and you see what it is that you know happens at the high school um but that's when my love for classical and jazz started right at the bottom of school for the arts it is absolutely awesome. And you've always stayed around Baltimore in terms of living, but you perform internationally, right? Yes, I do. Yes. You slipped that into our call yesterday. Uh, for those of you who don't know, when, I, when I'm going to have an artist on the podcast, we do a preliminary call beforehand so that we can get to know each other. And you mentioned that you perform almost more internationally than you do here in Baltimore. That said, where can normally where would people catch you performing in Baltimore under normal non COVID circumstances? We'll get to that in a second. Um, I'm in various different groups here in Baltimore. Um, the Urban Choral Arts Society, um, that's a youth group, youth group program where professional professional singers get to mentor the youth of Baltimore who aspire to sing classical, Broadway, jazz, and we, you know, we nurtured them and helped them into, uh, you know, colleges. We give, give out scholarships and things of that nature. So I work with them. It's also a group um, that I'm a part of called Mos uh, Dancing Whitley and Mosaic Sound. Um, we have two albums out and that's a gospel group that I'm a part of. And you had had a real interest in dance and uh, um, before you wanted to be a, a classically trained dancer. Yes. Me yes. too. <laughs> Absolutely. I actually did um, 14 years of the, uh, ballet, tap, and African dance. Now, so. let, me, let me back up one second, because I grew up with a mom who was a photographer, and now mm -hmm. I'm a professional photographer. So we share that, uh, that commonality. And I grew up with a father who was a writer. So what was it like? growing up in a extremely art intensive environment with two parents that were out singing did they encourage you or was it really stressful no they were very encouraging very encouraging especially when it was time to like learn music and they so my my dad he went to Walbrook senior high school and then my mom she went to Frederick Douglass high school so they were very heavy in their their um, high school choirs um so when it came to me wanting to you know learning handles messiah they knew it you know they didn't read music as proficient as i was able to learn but they knew all by ear like oh no it's supposed to go so they knew exactly where things were so they encouraged me a lot and then i had cousins who are um 
producers and they have been in the Morgan State University choir before and they were great help. Um, my one cousin in particular, April Bynum, she and her husband, um, they, okay, so now you need to learn how to do piano. I'm going to bribe you this piano and you're going to get some lessons and we're going to buy you piano books. And I literally started, you know, learning how to play the piano. So my family has been very encouraging. And in any time, you know, we have family gatherings of things, Candace, come on. And <laughs> my little brother, who is eight and a half years apart um, from me, he's younger. He sings as well. And so whenever we had family functions, it was like, Candace, Cameron, come on, it's time to sing, you know? So yeah, they've been very encouraging. That is really idyllic when, you, you know, when you think of growing up with the arts and growing up in an art enriched environment, <laughs> you know, I, I thought I was lucky, but what you're describing is just, you know, a, a blessing for, for life. Absolutely. And I Absolutely. love that they started with Handel's Messiah, which is, you know, not like, <laughs> not the <laughs> do re me. <laughs> yes. But you know, it's crazy because even the minister of music at my church at the time, um, Gary Hunt, his name is Gary Hunt. And I don't know if anyone is familiar with Sherry Hunt is like one of Baltimore's most talented singers. And um, so her brother um, would help me out during service because he knew that he was like, I, I see that you have an interest in music and we're going to help you hurt him and um, the drummer at the time, Tony Miller. And we, um, they would, you know, instill into me, you know, different things, different notes. Uh, it goes, dun, dun, da, 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 you know, different things like that, helping me with ear training, things of that nature. And um, so I've been really blessed throughout my life of having people to really pour into me. So you're giving some of that back through the mentor program that you mentioned. How, how long have you been doing that? Um, for the last two years. For the last two years. And where is that located? I'm sorry, it went by me kind of quick. So uh, we were ba we did most of our um, performances at the, uh, but it's in um, downtown Baltimore. But we've been doing them out of Faith Presbyterian, which is on Lock Raven. That's where most of our concerts now have been held. Of course, COVID hit. Uh, we're now <laughs> we are now dealing with month. I don't even know. Fourteen. Exactly. I don't I I forgot where we are. <laughs> who I am. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> How has your art had to change because of COVID and the pandemic and live events being not live? Um, oh, but man. it. At the beginning, it was really tough trying to do virtual, virtual recordings and things because the process is so tedious. Um, but I've gained a lot from it, you know, being able to edit and because that stuff, things like that interest me anyway. I, I love techie things. So like learning. So what I do normally is, you know, I'll record um, through a um, system and then do a video. So that was always, you know, trying to get those together was tough at the beginning. But now it's like, now I know what I'm doing and it's okay. <laughs> so that brings me to one of our mutual friends, Aaron Hill, uh, yes. who I interviewed on this podcast with his mom, which is one of my favorite interviews ever because yeah. my mom and I, you know, have our business. Yeah. Yeah. You know, so, um, but one of the things that both uh, Aaron and his mom said was that COVID was an opportunity to expand and learn new things and to yeah. grow as an artist. So you you concur with that? I do. It has been amazing um, just to see the things that you can do, and you're not limited. After the June Black Lives Matter protests with, with everything that happened and say their names and the election, you, you had a very visceral reaction with your art and produced um, Nina Simone's classic Strange Fruit. Um, tell me about that experience because what you produced is absolutely gorgeous. And um, how, how did that grow from your experiences with what was happening this past summer? Um, so when I first listened to the song, first of well, all, before the song, just with everything going on, it was 
I don't want to say depressing, but it was tear jerking just to see what the things that uh, my ancestors had to go through still happening today. You know, it's like, really, you know, I, there was supposed to be some progression here, but things still are, you know, changing, but not really. You know, it's like a step back. You step forward, step back, step forward, step back. So um, it was very in, in very emotional moment. Um, and actually, the original uh, Strange Fruit comes from Billie Holiday. And the way that she does it is heart wrenching. But and then listening to Nina Simone, I'm like, man, putting those two together, it was like, OK, so I have some I have some things that I need to get out, but do it through music, but also do it my my way. And um, it's a, a, a conductor friend of mine, Jeremy Winston, who he said, hey, you know, I think that we should come together and do something. He lives in Ohio and, you know, I'm here in Baltimore. He was able to play through the piano part and then, you know, send it to me and then I recorded it on my end and it just that night as I was recording the song, it just made it so more real. It was rain falling and something about rain and trying to sing at the same time. It's this movement that, you know, it's just an energy that you can feel. And um, I could just feel a weight lifted, uh, but at the same time, very noticed. You know, I just noticed a lot of uh, anger, hurt, pain, but love, you know, just, you know, just trying to wrap my head all around it. There is a fruit for the crows to pluck, for the rain to gather. So it was a very emotional moment, but it also felt good at the same time. That that song helped me to realize, you know, we're we're gonna make it out of this, but just you know, pray, lead with your heart, you know, love, but also be cautious at the same time. Yeah, it's it's a bit of anger because it's just like you know we fought long, we fought hard but people still don't see us, you know? And so it, it's hard because you, you try to walk through life from day to day, trying to be just like the next person, but seeing totally different. And color shouldn't, it shouldn't be a thing, but it is still in 2021, which is hard. Yeah. Um, yeah. All right. Well, so you express, so June happened, you had this visceral reaction, produced this, this really mind blowing, as far as I'm concerned, uh, video. What have been some of your other projects that you've been working on? Um, just recently, I've been able to work with N-Series. They're a company um, based out of Washington, DC, and they do live shows um, 
for different artists. And um, mine ha happens to air on May the 1st. So I'm excited about that. Um, it's pretty much just a, you know, a 90 minute show. Um, me singing some of my favorite songs um, from classical, jazz, r and I did some country, did some pop. So I did a whole genre switch around <laughs> the whole concert. So I'm excited to see that um, happen. Um, now, one more little project that we haven't talked about that that you are uh, interested in and that you're actually like kind of well known for is modeling. How yes. Is, how is it being a model? I, of course, have always wanted to be a model, but. <laughs> <laughs> it's not too late. <laughs> I could be a hand model. <laughs> I have very nice hands. <laughs> Except for where the cat has attacked me. Right. Um, so what is it like, and, and particularly, how is it different being a plus size model and being a, a, a model of color versus, you know, your average skinny white chick? So um, I love my curves. I love everything about my body. It's been, uh, there was a time when I didn't because, you know, your people will look and you're fat and da, 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 da. And then I had to realize, you know, hey, you know, yes, I am. And if there's something I want to change, then I can do that. But I'm comfortable in the skin that I'm in. Um, and a lot of times people want the curves that we have. We They want this and they want that. And so if I have it, why not accentuate the different parts of me that people, you know, it's not even about pe what people want to see. It's about how I want to portray myself in show off what God has created. Cause at the end of the day, that's who created us in his image. So I've always wanted to be um, an ambassador, not only for black women, but our black young girls who are gonna come up and sometimes, you know, they get a little bit overweight it, and it's okay, but there's a way to change it. So, you know, let's do things together. You know, it's always good to have friends who will help you be accountable for if you want to, you know, change, you know, how you look. Um, but what I hear you saying is embrace who you are. Embrace who you are. It's like, you know, we have an inner strength, we have an inner power. So just let that be, you know, flaunt it. I can't think of a better thing to close the show on. Um, Candace said, sometimes I just have to get things out. And when she sings, boy, it comes out. The audience is left breathless. There's no other way to describe it. Please check out her Facebook page, follow her on Instagram, and make sure you check out her concert that's coming up. Next week, I'll have another guest that just needs to get some things out. He's an old friend of mine, and we recently reconnected on Facebook. Because we reconnected on Facebook, I picked up the phone the other day and called him because I wanted to know a couple of things. You see, I knew Miles as Linda in high school. Miles is transsexual. He only recently went through the surgery right here in Baltimore at Johns Hopkins. So the person I knew as Linda is now Miles. And the stories he told me on my first call with him in 30 years, they would make most people crawl into the fetal position and rock back and forth in the corner. But not Miles. Miles is the same <laughs> happy-go-lucky vivacious, funny person that I remember back in high school, except now she's a he. So please join me. We'll sit down with Miles over the course of a couple of episodes and talk about what it's like to be transsexual in Baltimore. Everything from some of the legal pitfalls to growing up trans. Please join me on the next episode. We'll see you soon.